In lecture eight, we're going to discuss something called estimation. And uh, what is estimation? It's a type of inferential statistics. And what is inferential statistics? They are statistics that employ sample parameters or sample statistics to estimate population statistics. Why do we need them? Because it's still that problem. You cannot survey the population and it's not necessary to do that, okay? And in this class, we're going to learn how to do estimation. And we're also going to learn um, how to carry out hypothesis testing. They are both inferential statistics. And for estimation, you want to use it to estimate population parameters based on sample data, okay? So there are two types of estimation. The first one is called point estimation. The second one is called interval estimation. For point estimation, for example, you want to calculate, uh, say so you want to find out the population parameter which is mu, which is used to address mean, right? Population mean. But like I said, it's not possible to get um, mu directly and accurately. So we use a point estimator x bar to say, to represent, to represent population mean, which is mu, right? So here, because your x bar is a, uh, is a specific value, it's a point instead of an interval. What is an interval? Say on, a, on an axis from zero to 10. Okay, zero is one boundary, 10 is another boundary. And the axis between zero and 10 is what? Is an interval. So it's, it's not a point, it's a, it's a line. It's an interval, right? Here, you do not have an interval. You simply use a specific value, which is x bar, which is uh, the mean value of, of your sample, of observations in your sample, to estimate or to represent population mean. So this is a point estimation. Similarly, you can do the same thing for standard deviation you want to estimate population parameter sigma, which is the standard deviation of the population. And uh, you don't have it, but you can always uh, collect some uh, 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 observations and uh, form a sample and use the sample standard deviation S to represent population standard deviation. But this is a very, uh, say arbitrary, not arbitrary. This is just a process of violence. See that? You simply say that, okay, I don't know mu. I would just use x bar to replace mu, right? I don't know sigma. I simply use s, which is a standard deviation of my sample to, to, to replace a population standard deviation, which is um, uh, sigma. Uh, of course, you can do this, but uh, when you, you are doing this, you simply assume that a uh, population mean equals point, uh, not point mean, uh, population mean equals um, sample mean, population standard deviation equals um, sample standard deviation. Uh, of course, you can do that because it's possible that these uh, two parameters from population and sample they are very close to each other, not likely to be exactly uh, the same. But still, it's just uh, too big assumption you're making. You are simply uh, assuming that they're equal, they're equal to each other. So beyond that, we have a more, not more, let's just say, a process of less violent, okay? <laughs> to do estimation, we call it interval estimation, because it is un very unlikely that sample point estimations will exactly equal the population parameters, like I mentioned multiple times um, for the last slide, um, due to uncertainty in probability sampling. So um, point estimations, they are just too violent. 
Okay, <laughs> you 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 make a some an assumption that okay population parameters they are just equal to um, sample parameters, but in real experiments that is not likely to happen. So to determine how precise are our point estimators, we could extend a point estimator to an interval in which the population parameter is contained. It means that, okay, I'm not sure, I'm not sure uh, the, 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 about the accurate uh, population mean, but now I have a sample mean, right? Use this sample mean, based on this sample mean, I want to establish an interval, okay? For example, uh, the sample mean is zero. I want to use zero as the center of the interval. And uh, I expand this uh, point estimator, which is zero, to the left and to the right to form this interval. And uh, with a specific confidence level, I'm confident that population mean is somewhere within this interval. And for most experiments, that is simply good enough, right? Um, uh, I find out the sample mean and I use this sample mean to establish an interval with a specific confidence level. And uh, I would tell my boss, say, okay, I don't know the accurate, the exact population mean, but I established an interval and I'm confident, I'm 90% confident, I'm 95% confident, confident that population mean is within this interval. Of course, uh, the shorter the interval, the better, but that's the idea here. I mean, still you cannot find out the exact population mean, but this is much better than simply saying that, okay, this is sample mean, I'm assuming that this sample mean is equal to population mean. It's much better than that, right? Okay, so this is the, the, the focus of this lecture, interval estimation, okay? So before I can introduce the specific method for creating this uh, interval, some preparations must be done, okay? So first, let's talk about the distribution of sample means. Be careful here. It is not the distribution of observations in a sample. It is the distribution of multiple sample means, and each sample contains multiple observations, okay? So here we go. If the sampling process was repeated many times, for example, um, uh, I just collected uh, 100 temperature ratings for a specific city, and that is sample one and I repeat this sampling process multiple times. Then I have sample two, sample three, sample four, sample five, multiple samples, and there are 100 observations in each sample, okay? So multiple observations form a sample, and one sample has one sample mean, right? Right, because there are multiple observations in one sample, of course, you can have a sample mean. So when you have multiple samples, you have multiple sample means. And now we're talking about of distribution of this multiple sample means. Differentiate them, differentiate sample means from observation means, okay? Okay, it's not about observations, it's about sample means. We could get many different samples, right? And which give different sample means. Each sample has a mean. So what would the histogram of the sample means look like? Not observations, okay, sample means. So for example, I did multiple um, experiments, uh, which means I have multiple samples. Uh, I have a red sample. I have a blue sample, we have, uh, I have a green sample, I have a purple sample, but there could be more. Let's just say that we have four samples here. And for each sample, there is an X bar. Red X bar, of course, it is the sample mean for red sample, et cetera, et cetera, and et cetera. We have four sample means, 
Of course, there could be more. Let's just say there are a lot of them. And eventually, I can make a histogram of sample means, not observations, sample means. And uh, uh, the idea of histogram here stays the same. Uh, the horizontal axis is the actual uh, value for sample means. Could be zero, could be positive, could be negative. And the, uh, the, the, the vertical axis here is still frequency. That's the idea of histogram, right? So you can see that some sample means, they are more often than others, right? For this specific range from zero to one, a lot of sample means, they're within this range, more than 30 of them. So this is the idea of the histogram of sample means. And it looks like a normal distribution, right? Okay, here comes something called central limit theorem. That's another preparation, okay? Suppose an indefinitely large population, which has a distribution with mean and standard deviation, okay? We have a huge population, very large, pretty large, indefinitely, uh, infinitely large. And for this population, a large number of random samples of size n are drawn. Okay, here we have some assumptions here. A population, very large population with mean and standard deviation. And from this very large population, I draw, I drew a large number of random samples and each one has a size of n, n observations. Okay, as long as this n is sufficiently large, the frequency distribution of the sample means, this x bars, will have a normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation of the ratio between sigma and the square, foot, uh, square root of n. What does it mean? It means that when the sample size, when the sample size is large enough and you have multiple samples, the sample means follow normal distribution. Isn't that convenient? That's the power of central limit theorem which means that as long as these two assumptions are met, you can have this conclusion. What are these con uh, assumptions? Okay, he, they're very important, okay? First assumption, the population is infinitely large and the population has a mean and a standard deviation, of course. We don't know them, but there must be a mean and standard deviation, right? Okay, that's first assumption, very large population. Second assumption, a large number of random samples of size n are drawn from that population. That's all, that's two assumptions. As these two assumptions are met, we can say that as long as this n is large enough, the sample means they are following normal distribution. And uh, the mean of this normal distribution is mu, which is also the mean of the population. But the standard deviation is more complex. It's the ratio between the uh, population standard deviation and the square root of sample size. Okay, so we're going, we're going to conveniently use central limit theorem to do estimation later. But here comes the problem. We still have a problem here. As long as n is sufficiently large, how large is sufficiently large? Usually 30 is the threshold. As long as n is equal to or larger than 30, central limit theorem can be used. Okay, okay. It's very powerful, okay? If you, you're confused, uh, repeat this part of the video multiple times to figure out what it means. It means that as these two assumptions are met, 
we have this convenient conclusion about sample means. They are following normal distribution. Normal distribution is something very convenient because it's, it, 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 it's straightforward to, 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 dis, to describe with, with a mean and standard deviation, okay? Okay, so, so this is the histogram I showed you in the last slide, right? It's a histogram for sample means, X bars. And as long as N is large enough, like I said, 30 or more, then we can simply use this normal distribution to represent all those histograms. Okay, isn't that convenient? Okay, you don't, you can use one uh, simplified distribution, normal distribution, or later I will show you even more simplified standard normal distribution to address any data set that can employ a central limit theorem. Okay, okay. So on the right side, we have uh, the PDF for, 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 for normal distribution, right? So the horizontal axis, of course, it's, it's, it's X, it's X. Um, but here, more specifically, uh, it should be, uh, let's just say X, because this X is not uh, for observation, it's abstract, it's for this um, function FX, okay? But yeah, here we have the normal distribution to address to address this uh, histogram. So the central limit theorem only applies to sample mean, okay, not for other sample statistics. The original population does not have to be normally distributed, right? This is even more convenient. As long as the original population is large enough, I don't even care if this population is following normal distribution or not, no. And generally, a sample size um, larger than 30, uh, I mentioned this before, right, could be regarded as sufficiently large so that the sampling distribution of sample means is approximately normal distribution. Okay, so the rest of the class, for the rest of the class, um, at least for this lecture, let's, let's, let's just be conservative a little bit. At least for this lecture, um, we accept the assumptions for central limit theorem, which means that um, we accept that um, if there are multiple samples, uh, sample this this sample means for these multiple samples, they are following uh, the sample means they are following normal distribution. Okay, now let's talk about confidence interval. Preparations are done. Okay. The central limit theorem states sample means follows a normal distribution when the sample size is large enough. This is the summary of uh, central limit theorem. We could use this property to estimate the probability that the true mean lies in an interval about the sample mean. How to do that? First, let's just say the probability is called confidence level. Confidence level. That's, and it is denoted by one minus alpha multiply 100. So usually alpha is equal to 0 0.05. If that is the case, one minus alpha multiply 100%, what's the result? 95%. If alpha is equal to equal to 0 0.1 then the result is 90 percent confidence level right if alpha is equal to 0 0.01 then the confidence level is 99 percent okay and we want to find out this interval this is it is also called confidence interval okay okay and uh, like I mentioned before, we will just make this even more simplified. Beyond normal distribution, we have standard normal distribution. And uh, let me review this. In standard uh, normal distribution, you have to, what? You have to convert actual values to Z scores. And here, since we're talking about sample means, in order to address um, 
um, the, the, the distribution of sample means using standard normal distribution, you have to you have to convert sample means to their z values. Okay, and uh, uh, the convenient part about standard normal distribution here is that when you assign a specific alpha value, for example, alpha equals 0 0.1, it means that the confidence interval is 90%. Let me get back, okay? Sorry, the confidence level is 90%, right? Confidence interval is something we want we want to find out. So if alpha is equal to 0 0.1, then the confidence level is 90%. So 90% confidence level means that um, the left side of the mean accounts for 45% of the whole area under the curve. The right side, 45% of the whole area under the curve, which is the shaded area or uh, the area marked by red. So if the, 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 the red area is account for 90% of the total area under the curve, what is the left tail accounting for? Is it 10%? No, it's 5% because there are two tails, one tail to the left, one tail to the right. So to the left, this, um, empty area, this empty uh, region is, account, is accounting for 5% of the total area under the curve, similarly for the area to the right, okay? And, okay, this blue area is accounting for 5% of the total area under the curve. This is very important. Okay, because we're talking about we're talking about a two tails issue, one tail to the right, one tail to the left. Okay, and this area is approximately zero point zero five. The exact value is zero point zero four nine five, and it is used to address the probability that z is equal to a larger than 1.65 and this specific value here z value is 1.65 you say um how do i know this area is 0 0.0495 when it is one when z value is 1.65 you still remember table a2 right right that's the purpose of table a2 and for the left side, the Z value is negative 1.65. And this area shaded by blue also accounts for 5% of the total area under the curve. So, so the probability between negative and positive 1.65 accounts for 90% of the total area under the curve. This is for 90%. You can do the same thing for 95%. It means that alpha equals 0 0.05. And you can say this confidence level, this confidence level has been increased. So the, the Z value changed from 1.65 to 1.96 or a negative 1.96. Uh, so the, shade, uh, the, the, the larger area, okay, the, the, the larger area defined by this 95% confidence level is larger than 90% because it's 95% obviously, right? So here is the formula here, okay? And if it is, if the alpha value is equal to 0 0.01, this even larger confidence level here is for 99% confidence level. And uh, uh, how did I find, find out these two confidence levels? It's just the same method I used 
for 90%. And uh, this time, if you are talking about 99% confidence level, the boundaries here are negative 2.58 and positive 2.58 for Z values. Okay, so different Z values, they are forming different confidence levels. And the different confidence levels decide, decide the probability of Z between these two boundaries. Okay, it's a little bit hard to understand, but um, like I mentioned before, at the beginning of the semester, you need to invest some time to, to, to repeat, try to comprehend, okay? Okay, now we have three formulas here. If we are, uh, uh, we're using 0 0.1 as alpha, this is the probability we have. Probability of Z between negative and positive 1.65 is 90% or 0 0.9. Similarly, for alpha equals 0 0.05 or alpha equals 0 0.01, okay? Here we go. Let's just suppose the sample size n is sufficiently large. According to the central limit theorem, the frequency distribution of sample mean x bar is normal with mean mu and standard deviation sigma divided by square root of n. This is central uh, a central limit theorem, right? And what is Z score? Now we have Z scores for, for boundaries, right? Uh, 1.65, 1.96, 2.58. But how to calculate Z score? Z score for an uh, X bar is this. X bar minus mu, which is the population uh, mean we want to estimate and divided by the ratio between sigma and uh, square root n. And this uh, denominator is actually the standard deviation of sample means, right? So here we go. Let's just replace, replace this Z value by, we have Z value uh, within a specific range, right? Negative, positive, positive, negative, positive negative, positive. But here we replace Z score with this specific formula. And this formula is about X bar, mu, sigma, and N. So we have these three new formulas. You can see here the only difference between these three formulas and these three blue formulas is that there is no Z. Z is replaced by a more specific formula here. Okay, okay. Still following? If you do not follow, um, try to uh, go back a little bit and uh, come back and come back. So, okay, let's, let's continue. So the three Z scores, 1.65, 1.96, and 2.58, they are associated with three confidence levels, one minus alpha, where alpha is 0 0.1, 0 0.05 and 0 0.01, respectively. We can denote them by Z half alpha for convenience, okay? So then we have, now we don't even have specific numbers. We use negative and positive Z half alpha to address, to replace these specific values. Okay, and uh, the probability is equal to one minus alpha. So this formula is the abstract one. There is no specific values anymore. As long as you assign a specific alpha, then you know the value of one minus alpha. You also know the value for Z half alpha, right? And then, you want to find out the mu value, okay? Okay, so what happened here? You simply convert this formula about X bar, mu, sigma, and N to a formula only about mu. It's actually mu itself. You simply use um, fundamental principles um, for equations to move 
um, sigma n and x bar to the left side and to the right side. Okay, I would just skip that process and give you the result. So still remember the purpose of, of, of confidence interval? We want to find out an interval for population mean based on sample mean, right? Here is your method. Mu is what? Mu is population mean. According to this equation, the population mean should be larger than the left side, should be smaller than the right side. So the interval has been established. As long as you can find out the left side of the formula and the, the right side of the formula, boom, you have the interval. And the mu should be larger than the lower boundary of, or the left boundary of the interval and smaller than the right boundary of, of the interval. So next, how to calculate the left side and right side of the formula? As long as you have x bar, as long as you have z half alpha and uh, sigma and n, then you have it. Okay, okay. So what does this specific equation mean? It means that one minus alpha multiply 100% of the time, the true mean should lie within this range of the sample mean. So for example, for example, for example, if alpha equals 0 0.1, it means that 90% 90, 90 of the time, the true mean should lie within positive, negative, z 0 0.05 multiply sigma, then divided by the square root of n of the sample mean. Very long, right? So here, what we care about is the value of alpha. Then we care about the value of z half alpha. Why is it half alpha? Because it's a two-tail problem. Still remember the left side, the, 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 the blue area on the left side of z value accounts only for what? Half of the area that is outside the, 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 the confidence level, right? So if uh, alpha equals 0 0.1, the confidence level is 90%. The left blue tail, if you go back to the slide before, the left blue tail only accounts for 0 0.05 or 5% 5 of, the, uh, of the total area. Right? So when you try to find the Z value, you need to use half alpha instead of alpha for table A2. Okay, this could be a little tricky, but um, later I will give you examples. It will be more clear. Okay, so for example, specifically, when alpha equals 0 0.05, we can see that our true population mean should 95% of the time lie within positive and negative 1.96 multiply sigma divided by square root n of sample mean. You ask why 1.96? Because you have decided the value for alpha. Then you know half alpha is 0 0.025 then you can find the z value for that, right? And that z value is 1.96. Let's go back. Now alpha equals what? 0 0.05, 0 0.05, 95% confidence, confidence level, right? right? So this is a formula you want to use when alpha is equal to 0.05. You can see that Z value is negative and a positive 1.96. Okay, okay. And yeah, let's get back. So 
steps for constructing a confidence interval. The first step, you want to specify a confidence level using alpha. You will say, which one, which one should I choose? 0 0.01, 0 0.05, uh, I mean, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, or 0 0.01. It depends. Okay, if, um, if you want, uh, I mean, it depends on your application. Okay, if your confidence, uh, you want a very high confidence level, it means that your, you, your, uh, your estimated interval, I mean, if you want a higher confidence level and your estimated interval will be pretty long, then you should use 99% um, confidence uh, level, which means that your alpha value should be 0 0.01. If you want a relatively low uh, confidence level, say 90%, then you, you just use 0 0.1 as alpha value, okay? And because your confidence level is low, your interval should, will, be, will, be, will be narrower because your confidence level is low. That interval is actually more accurate it's more accurate, but you're not that confident. You know the idea here? And the second step is look up the Z-score corresponding to half alpha in a standard normal table, A2. But if you are using 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01, um, you should memorize that this Z-values, they are, associated with 1.65, 1.96, and 2.58. They are for uh, 0 0.1 as alpha, 0 0.05 as alpha value, or 0 0.01 for alpha value. Usually, it's just these three Z values, okay, depending on specific alpha value. Okay, step three, uh, multiply the Z score by the standard deviation, then divide it by the square root of n, which is um, the size of your samples, okay? And step four, find the confidence interval by adding and subtracting this product from the sample main, okay? Okay, next, next slide is about, um, is about specific examples. Uh, to, to, to construct a confidence interval. I think I have given so much information in this video, okay? I will just stop here and I will continue uh, in the next video. Thank you.